As the debate over health care in this country continues to rage, we are joined by longtime Washington Post correspondent T.R. Reid, who says that we can learn a lot from other nations that are providing care for all their citizens at a fraction of the cost. His new book, The Healing of America, A Global Quest for Better, Cheaper and Fairer Health Care, chronicles his journey to 10 countries around the world seeking treatment for his own shoulder. TR, welcome to the program. Delighted to be here. So tell us about your journey um, around the world to try to find sort of treatment for your shoulder. Was it, was it a broken shoulder? How did you come up with this idea? Uh, I smashed my shoulder in the Navy a long time ago. The idea was to figure out how it is that all the other countries like us, industrialized democracies, managed to cover everybody with high quality care and to spend half as much as we do. How do they do that? And I figured, well, since I'm going to doctors and hospitals around the world, take my bum shoulder with me, see if I can get it fixed along the way. So, so you ended up going to 10 countries to research the healthcare systems overseas in these places. And you found that there are basically, what, four systems that exist out there. And we here in the United States have a hybrid of those four systems. Yeah, that's right. Some countries have famous socialized medicine where government provides the care and government pays for the care, like Britain, Spain, Italy. But taxpayers pay for it. Yes, exactly. Um, A lot of countries, though, Germany, France, Belgium, Switzerland, Japan, cover everybody with private docs, private hospitals, and private insurance. It's not socialized medicine. And then some countries, Canada, Australia, Taiwan, have private doctors and private hospitals, but a government payment scheme. So what do you call that, Dodget? semi-socialized medicine. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious about this term socialized medicine because don't you think that uh, to some extent a lot of people don't actually understand what that means? I mean you talk about socialized, do you think most people think of socialism? I mean most Americans... That was the idea. People don't know what socialized medicine means. This is a term that was invented by a PR firm in 1947 when the American Medical Association, the doctors were trying to fight Harry Truman's universal coverage plan. It was the depth of the Cold War, and the argument was if you want to provide health care for your neighbor, you're a commie, you're socialist. Nobody can really define what it means. I guess the British system where government owns the hospitals, employs the doctors, and pays the bills, that's probably socialized medicine. Let's get back to these, these four systems that you found. So we have a hybrid of four of these. What does that mean for us? Does it mean that in the United States we get better health care, but we pay a little more? What do we get? Uh, some Americans get the best care in the world. The problem in our system is uh, tens of millions of people don't get in the door. Lots of people can't get any care until it's almost too late and they go to the emergency room when they're about dying. And no other country does that. All the other countries, whatever their model, have a basic level of care that everybody gets. The result is, in those countries, nobody dies of treatable diseases because you can go to the doctor. In America, our government says about 22,000 Americans die of treatable diseases every year because they can't afford a doctor. So what can we learn then? I mean, from your experience of traveling around the world and researching these other systems, how can the United States benefit from the, the debate that's going on right now that President Obama is having to reform the health care system? Well, I came away pretty optimistic. I know we could cover everybody at a reasonable cost, and the reason I know we could do it is because all the other countries like us do it. Here's what they did. All of them first decided on the goal. Doggone it, we're going to give health care to everybody in our country who needs it. And if you agree to that commitment, then you can find a mechanism to get there. But in the U.S., we've never made the commitment to provide health care for everybody. I think that's the first step. Did you come across anybody who went bankrupt in these systems? Yeah. Oh, in the other countries, no. Uh, In America, about 700,000 people go bankrupt for medical bills. In Britain, zero. France, zero. Germany, zero. Japan, zero. Other countries don't let that happen. We're the only rich country where that happens. Right. And the other thing that you say is that many American notions about other healthcare systems are actually myths. Um, can you can you explain what? Well, you mean it's not that? all socialized medicine. As I said, lots of right. countries cover everybody in the private sector. Uh, they don't all keep people waiting and limit choice. As a matter of fact, in most countries, there's none of this in-network or pre-authorization. In France, Germany, Japan, you go to any doctor, any hospital, any chiropractor, and insurance has to pay the bill. There's no limitation. So most people have more choice. Many countries have less waiting, and they all pay less. This notion that there 
hopelessly inefficient bureaucracies is not true. The least efficient payment scheme in the world is the American one. But here in the United States, I mean, the kind of the healthcare system that we have, uh, when people from overseas sort of look at it, they may say, well, you know, that is a reflection of American cultural values. Uh, we have the kind of healthcare system that we have over here. The French have theirs and the British have theirs. That's what they want and that's what suits their kind of cultural values. Well, what, what do you say to that argument? I mean, do you think it's It's absolutely valid? true. Every country's healthcare system reflects its basic cultural values. And the other rich countries have all decided that they want to cover everybody. And it costs some money, although they spend less than we do. We've never made that commitment. And you know what? The other countries love dumping on us. They feel smugly superior to America because they know we let people go bankrupt. We let people stay sick without care. They cover everybody, and it makes them feel better. Well, what do you think that the, the health care system that we have says about our cultural, our national values? If you decide that everybody in your country should be able to go to a doctor when she's sick, you can design a system that will get you there. If you decide that the most important thing is prosperity and economic growth and creating jobs, then maybe you come up with a system where rich people or people with good insurance get the best care in the world and tens of millions of others are left out. I mean, as we have this debate, what do you think are the most kind of crucial things that need to be kind of presented as part of the debate that Americans are not hearing about? The most important decision is we've got to make a commitment to cover everybody, and we don't do it. The notion that if you're sick, you can go down to the emergency room and get free treatment, it's not true. If you're dying, you get free treatment. You can't get the kind of standard care you need to deal with diabetes or asthma or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis by going to the emergency room. It doesn't work. So Americans need to realize that we are leaving a lot of people outside the door in the richest country in the world. If we decided to let them in, we could provide health care for everybody at a reasonable cost. How's your shoulder? My shoulder got much better. Less pain, more movement. That was a success. And I know that we could fix our health care system because other countries have done it. So that, too, was a success. Okay, T.R. Reid, thank you very much for joining us. Delighted to be here. Thanks. Mm -hmm.